Good morning. For the past two weeks, we've been in a message series called Hometown Christmas. And two weeks ago, I talked about the city of Jerusalem and its prominence of that day. Last week, we talked about Nazareth, a place that was uh, uh, less than. Uh, people thought that people from Nazareth were less than people. They looked down on them. Can anything good indeed come from the town of Nazareth? And this week, we're going to look at the little village of Bethlehem. And the town of Bethlehem is small. Surprisingly, even so back then than it, is, than it is now, the population was around 300 people back when Jesus was born. It was a town where many people grew up in, but they would often travel away. They would leave that community to go for lands of greater opportunity. But Luke chapter 2, it says these words, In those days, in the days that Christ was to be born, at just the right time, and then when fullness of time had come, God decided that it was time to redeem man, so he sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. It says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. So everyone went to his hometown to register for the census. For Mary and Joseph, it meant coming back to this quaint little town of Bethlehem. They're about four or five miles from the city of Jerusalem, and you would think, God, well, you know, we're so close to Jerusalem. Why do we have to go all the way down to Bethlehem in order to, to for the census? Why can't the, you know, the, the baby just be born in Jerusalem? And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an hour's journey. They could travel there at different times, you know, for importance of, of significance. You know, why, why do we have to travel such a far journey at such a stage of pregnancy? I'm nine months pregnant. Don't know if I... If I understand all of what's unfolding before me, but there's a census, we got to go, the law requires it. It's not the kind of city where people would be looking for the promised Messiah to come from. Bethlehem was a small town, and the stable was a place where animals were kept. Certainly not the delivery room for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's not the type of birthplace that you would expect Jesus to be born and the savior of the world to be born in a stable, the king of kings to be laying in a feeding trough. But after a 75 mile journey from Nazareth, Mary and Joseph had no place to stay. Joseph, guys, like most of us, he didn't call ahead for reservations. Okay, he didn't check in at the, the Bethlehem Holiday Inn, knowing that he was going to be there in just a few days. No, there were no other options open for them. The only place was a stable. The announcement of the shepherd's birth, Jesus' birth is made to the shepherds. The shepherds say to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and let us see this thing that has been told to us. Now there's an announcement made, and an angelic announcement is made to the shepherds, and the shepherds say, we're going to hustle down there. Let's go down to Bethlehem and see this thing that's been told to us. So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open them up to Luke, the, the second chapter. I think it's page number 711 and the chair Bible in front of you. And this morning, let's go to Bethlehem. And let's see this little village and how it got caught up in the Christmas story. Why would God choose Bethlehem? I mean, think about it. It's this tiny, little, obscure village in the shadow of Jerusalem. It didn't seem to have much to offer in that particular moment in history. But I will say this for Bethlehem. It is just one of the many parts of the Christmas story that really don't add up when you begin to think about it, at least in the way that I'm thinking, and maybe in the way that we think today. It just doesn't seem as prominent of a place that it needs to be to bring forth the Messiah. It's just not the way you would expect for the Son of God to be born into the world. And if you read through the Christmas story, and if you could step back from it just objectively, I think there are, are a number of different factors, a number of different circumstances that almost seem to indicate that perhaps God hadn't really thought this process through. Maybe this was just a last minute thing in his mind. Because, I mean, if he had, it just seems that things would have unfolded so much more smoothly on that first Christmas. And so we sit back, we, we look at it from an objective standpoint, and we say, you know, God, maybe, maybe he just kind of threw this deal together. Maybe it's a last minute thought, an afterthought. Hey, I think I'm making me born in, in Bethlehem. But it is crystal clear, if you know your Bible, if you have studied the Old Testament, that God had indeed thought this plan through to the most minute detail. In fact, God had put this plan, the Christmas story, into motion way back in the first book of the Bible, way back in Genesis. In the third chapter, Adam and Eve, they sin. 
They eat of that forbidden fruit, whatever that fruit might have been, we don't know. And the moment they took the bite, the shadow of the cross appeared on the horizon. And so we read in Genesis, the third chapter, in the 15th verse, we read the very first messianic prophecy that God was somehow putting this whole story into script. That he was going to send the Messiah at just the right time, at just that particular moment in history, to redeem mankind back to himself. That's really the beginning of the Christmas story, way back in Genesis, the third chapter. Thousands of years come and go, and there are hundreds of very specific prophecies, all pointing to the very well thought out plan of God. God had indeed clearly thought it through. But it's just always hard for you and I in our finite minds to understand exactly what God was thinking. I'm sure the prophets of the Old Testament must have wondered this to themselves as they recorded these prophecies. Isaiah, for example, wrote his prophecy some 700 years before Jesus was even born. And there are more than 100 prophecies, messianic prophecies, in the book of Isaiah alone. But I bet Isaiah found himself at times kind of scratching his head, sitting back and saying, you know, are you sure this is a good idea, God? I mean, really? Coming to earth as a baby? I mean, a lot could go wrong with this plan, God. Let's think through the process here. Are you talking about a teenage virgin to be the mother of Jesus? It just seems so scandalous, so impossible. And where did you say he was going to come from? I haven't even heard of that town. Where is it? My guess is that the prophets sometimes had to wonder, God, what in your world (laughs) are you thinking? It must have seemed very different to the prophets and even to us now the way that you and I would do it. I mean, if you and I were in charge, we probably would have scripted the Christmas story completely different than God. Now, it's hard for us to think of the Christmas story like this because we've heard it so much. We've we've kind of become numb to the whole events that transpired over 2,000 years ago. We just kind of come to accept it. You know, you and I, at times, I think we see the Christmas story as this kind of picturesque Norman Rockwell-type story. But if we could just push pause on the story for just a moment with me and just step back and look at it from an objective standpoint, I think you'd have to agree that a lot of it just seems too unrealistic for it to become reality. I mean, think about it. The definition of, of unrealistic is this, not taking into account how things would actually happen. And if you're talking about the Son of God coming into the, into the world, coming to earth, stepping out of eternity and into time as a baby, then the whole story just doesn't seem to take into account the things that would have actually had to happen. In other words, it's just not what you would expect for God wrapping himself in flesh. God coming to earth in the form of a man. I'm sure Isaiah must have wondered. But God explained himself to Isaiah. and Isaiah, the 55th chapter, towards the end of the book, God says these words to Isaiah, and I know you have heard these words quoted to you many, many times. Maybe you quoted them to other people, particularly in their times of despair. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. God says, Isaiah, the way you would think isn't necessarily the way I would do things. The way you think isn't the way I think. And I want us to take a look at the Christmas story through the lens, because when we see that through the lens of objectivity, though God doesn't necessarily do things the way we would do them, his ways can always be trusted. Do you believe that? That God's ways, no matter what happens in your life, no matter how bad, no matter how good, no matter how tragic, no matter how dramatic, God can always be trusted in each and every moment of our lives. We can never not trust him. I've heard this verse quoted, Isaiah 55, at different times in my life. It's usually when something in life doesn't turn out the way I had hoped it would. Or you've probably heard it quoted in your life, and maybe you've quoted it to others. Maybe it's an untimely death. You know, God, I just don't understand. This person was so young. He or she had their whole life to look forward to. And yet you've chosen, God, for some reason not to make it happen, but you allowed it to happen. Maybe it's the loss of a job. You know, God, I worked for this company for 25 years. I can't believe this happened to me. Right now, this time of the year, 
How do I explain that to my children or to my grandchildren that I don't have money this year to, to buy them Christmas presents? Or maybe you've been looking forward to a child being born for years and the find the child arrives and you find out that it, this is a special needs child. And you think to yourself, God, you know, we have waited so long, but why? But then you realize that this child is special, it's unique, and this is a child that you have to give everything to. And God believes enough in you to love you enough and trust you enough to raise such a child. Maybe it's a marriage that didn't turn out the way you expected it to turn out. And you've been struggling for quite some time dealing with that issue in your life. So someone will often quote this verse. They'll say, well, God's ways aren't our ways and his thoughts aren't our thoughts. And it's almost always said with kind of this spirit of defeat. Kind of that acceptance that this is just the way life has to be. This is the hand I've been dealt. It's almost a spirit of resignation. Well, I guess... I mean, if this is the way it is, I was hoping God would come through for me. I was hoping he would work this whole thing out differently. But I guess, I guess God's thoughts aren't my thoughts and God's ways just aren't my ways. I can't help but wonder if perhaps Mary and Joseph thought those things on that very first Christmas night. I'm sure they knew this verse from Isaiah 55 and maybe they quoted it to one another as they were making such a difficult journey from a small town of Nazareth to an even smaller town of Bethlehem. Mary riding on the back of a donkey, nine months pregnant. You know they got to the village of Bethlehem late because at nine months pregnant there were frequent bathroom stops along the way. (laughs) And it just, just seems like it wasn't thought out well in the mind of God. And I'm sure Mary expected things to go a little bit differently for her. Don't you think so? I mean, really. From her perspective, when an angel appears to you with such a grand announcement and says to you that you will be the mother of the long awaited Messiah, you got to believe. I mean, you got to believe that Mary, in her mind, heard of this moment in the past that this was going to come out, this was going to happen, that a Messiah would indeed come, that this prophecy would eventually be fulfilled, and then the angel makes this announcement to her Mary, you will be the mother of the Messiah. Wow. And I'm thinking that Mary must have assumed automatically that God had favor on her. God was going to take care of all the details. And being the mother of the Son of God, she would have some perks. I mean, some advantages. Maybe she would be the first woman to ever have a pain-free labor, you know? (laughs) Something like that. That all things would go well for her. But on that first Christmas night, she had to wonder, God, I mean, really, God, what are you thinking? This isn't how I would have scripted it. This isn't how I thought it would be. I was supposed to be planning a wedding, let alone a baby shower, and God's ways are not our ways. I know that's true. If I were in charge on that first Christmas, I can tell you I would have done some things rather differently than God. How about you? I mean, I I don't think at that particular time, I don't think I would have allowed a census to be taken. I mean, the mother of my child is is nine months pregnant. I'm going to make her travel 75 miles to a little town in Bethlehem on the back of a donkey. I don't think I would have a census be taken at that particular moment in history. Maybe if I did, then maybe Mary and Joseph, those names wouldn't be included in the census. They would be, you know, dismissed from having to make that journey. And if they did travel, I mean, it wouldn't have been on the back of a donkey if I were in charge. I think I would have provided some heavenly transportation. Maybe they could have caught a flight on Gabriel Airlines. Maybe I'd have just, you know, transported her at that particular moment. Something like that. Beamed her over. I want to make Mary, carrying my child, the mother of the Messiah, ride on the back of a donkey... 75 miles to an obscure little village. No, you know what I, Jerusalem would have been fine. That's where I would have had the baby be born. It's a metropolitan area. It's populated, it's, it's popular. It's certainly more civilized. Probably had the best hospitals around. That's where I would have had the baby be born because it wouldn't have been Bethlehem. And when they got to Jerusalem, they wouldn't have gotten any to the end to check in and, and realize that there wasn't any room for them. Now, if I scripted it, 
they, when they got there, there would have been a mix-up at the front desk. And those who were staying in the presidential suite were now relegated to the stable, and Joseph and Mary would have had the presidential suite in the finest hotel in all of Jerusalem. That's how I would have made Mary and Joseph roll if I were in charge. My ways would have been way different than his ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And most of us are just pretty aware that in our own lives, but this Christmas story, it just doesn't read the way we would want it to read. Now, we've kind of, in our culture in these times, we look back on the Christmas story, and I think we kind of romanticize it. I mean, we play our Christmas carols, we play our music as we're putting up the lights in the tree and decorating the house, and we remember this horrible journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem as something that was sweet. This sweet little trip that they're in a stable, the cattle are lowing. The cattle are lowing in a delivery room? I mean, ladies, is that a problem for you? I mean, think about it. If you're the mother, that's kind of an issue. Get the cows out. <laughs> but that's how we tend to look at it, right? I don't know if you do this in your home, but at Christmas time when we decorate, we bring out the scented candles. And, you know, there's all different kinds of scents going on in the house. Saturday, I was out Christmas shopping. I went to a Bath and Body Works. I just love the smell of that store. And you walk into that, and they had all these candles on display, you know, two for 20 bucks. And that's where I did most of my Christmas shopping because I'm cheap, okay? <laughs> this time of the year, there are a lot of different scents. You walk in the house and... Smell apple and cinnamon. There's pine. I am convinced that weight gain is primarily attributed to these scented candles. <laughs> you walk in the house, is that apple pie? No, it's a candle. Good, I want some apple pie. <laughs> I thought, what if they came up with a candle nativity scented? A nativity scented candle. You know what that might smell like? I don't think it's going to smell like apple pie. That's not what it's going to smell like at all. I don't know if you are familiar with this company. It's called Mandels. Now, Mandels make man-scented candle, candles. You say, well, man-scented candles, what's that? It doesn't sound like a, a very big market for such, a, for such an item. But think about it for a moment. One of them smells like an auto shop. <laughs> auto shop, it's called. The other one is called Bass Fisher. It smells like you're on a fishing trip. My favorite is called the slab, and that's the slab of bacon. Because <laughs> we all know, guys, right, everything tastes better when it's wrapped in bacon. I like my donuts wrapped in a bacon, okay? <laughs> it just tastes better that way. That's the manly, manly scent. And I think that mandel approach probably would get just a little bit closer to what it would have smelled like that very first Christmas. I mean, in that stable, we don't smell apple and cinnamon, Right? If you were going to have candles that very first Christmas from the nativity scene, it may have been called something like shepherd sweat. <laughs> Dirty donkey. <laughs> Camel dung. Something like that, because that's what it smelled like. But that's sort of what represents what we've done to Christmas, isn't it? We've tidied it all up, and we've made Christmas smell all nice and pretty, and it's just this beautiful moment. And I would agree that any time a baby is born, it is indeed a precious moment. It really is. It's something to celebrate. But I'm just saying, it's not what you expect for the Son of God coming into the world. And I'm sure they must have thought, God... What are you thinking? And of all places, why would you choose Bethlehem? Why not Rome? Why not Greece? Why not Athens? Why not Alexandria? I mean, those are more prominent places. Those are places of, of powerful people. That's the place where the king of kings should be born. Or at least, why not Jerusalem? It's just a few miles down the road. Come on, God. What are you thinking? And I'm sure that Mary and Joseph must have felt these things inside. They had to have. I mean, let's face it. I know I would have. And they stepped out of the stable into the night, perhaps holding the Son of God in their arms. And as they stepped out into that dark, cold night, they would have seen on the hillside an incredible palace that stood 90 feet tall. 
It was Herod the Great's palace, King Herod the Mighty, King Herod the Wealthy, King Herod the Powerful. And I wonder on that first Christmas of Mary and Joseph as they stepped out of that stable holding the King of Kings in their arms, as they looked up to that palace, they saw its grandeur. I mean, it, the, the building alone took up 45 acres. There was 200 acres that surrounded the grounds. I wonder if they held that baby in their arms as they looked up and they said, God, really? Are you sure about this? And then they went back into the stable and they kept themselves and the baby warm for the night. Why Bethlehem? Why a stable? Author Max Lucado has written a piece where he tries to imagine a prayer that perhaps Joseph prayed. He could have prayed that prayer on the first night, and here's how it goes. This isn't the way I planned it, God, not at all. My child being born in a stable, this isn't the way I thought it would be. A cave with sheep and donkeys, hay and straw. My wife giving birth with only the stars to hear her pain. This isn't at all what I imagined. No, I imagine family. I imagine grandmothers. I imagine neighbors clustered outside the door and friends standing at my side. I imagine the house erupting with the first cry of the infant, slaps on the back, loud laughter, jubilation. This is how I thought it would be. The coming of the angel... I've accepted it. The questions people asked about the pregnancy, I can tolerate. The trip to Bethlehem, that's fine. But why birth in a stable, God? Why? And Joseph maybe never prayed such a prayer. But I think if you and I can be honest with each other this morning, we probably have, haven't we? Oh, we may have never prayed a prayer like that in a stable, but perhaps outside the door of an emergency room. I know I've prayed a prayer like that outside the door of an emergency room. Or maybe you prayed that prayer in the pressures of a courtroom. Or maybe it was in the quietness of a church building such as this. Or maybe it was on a well-manicured lawns of a cemetery. You prayed a prayer like that and you said, God, what are you thinking? I mean, really? This isn't the way it was supposed to go. Not at all. This wasn't my thought process. Things are supposed to turn out differently in my life. And maybe this Christmas you wouldn't say it out loud, but in your heart you find yourself second-guessing God. Because you thought, you thought, hey, you know, I'd be married by now. Never thought I would be single this long. You thought that by this Christmas, by the holidays, certainly you would find a job. Maybe you thought you'd be pregnant by now. You've been trying for so long. And what a perfect time to be pregnant, the time where, when, when Jesus was born. You thought that your family would turn around, that, that, that things would be healed. And, and you're very much aware of the fact that your thoughts are not God's thoughts. And it's not that you want to second-guess God. I mean, you really don't. You want to trust him wholeheartedly. You want to have faith. You want to believe. But it's just so hard to understand why. So it's not hard for you to look at this Christmas story through the lens of Isaiah 55 and say, I don't understand it. This isn't the way I would have done it. And so as we look at Bethlehem in hindsight, it answers a lot of questions to us about God. It helps me. We find ourselves looking at our own story and asking why. But Bethlehem teaches us something about our faith. It really does. It teaches us something about the glory of God as well, how powerful he really is. So here's the first question I'd like for us to answer today regarding God's plan for Christmas as we begin to wrap this service up. Why Bethlehem? And the answer is because God can. Because he can. God's power is so great, he didn't need Rome to accomplish his purpose. Bethlehem will do just fine. This little obscure village is perfect for God to work in. Greece isn't required. Athens or Alexandria are not necessary. Jerusalem, not even Jerusalem. Bethlehem will work. Why? Because God does his best work in places like Bethlehem. When you think there is nothing to offer, 
When you think that you don't have anything at all to bring to the table, that's where God shows up in a mighty way. And that's where God does some of his best work. Bethlehem was an insignificant town that is made significant only because God chose to make it significant. In fact, in the book of Micah, back in the Old Testament, the prophet Micah, he gets it right. He prophesies the exact location that the Messiah was to be born, that he would come from Bethlehem. And in his prophecy, as he records this, he goes out of his way to describe the insignificance of this little town. In Micah 5, 2, and I like the way it's written in the message paraphrase, but you, Bethlehem, David's country, the runt of the litter, I like that. You're the runt of the litter. From you will come the leader who will shepherd rule Israel. Bethlehem is just a tiny little suburb of Jerusalem. It's outside of the city. It's not the kind of place that you tell people that you were from because they wouldn't know what you were talking about. You would say, I'm from this little village just outside of Jerusalem. Oh, okay, I think I, I, think I know what Jerusalem is. And that's where Bethlehem was. It's just not the kind of place that you would tell people you were from. It's a tiny little village. It's a shepherd's village, in fact which would have brought some shame to that area in that particular culture. And that's where Jesus is born? I think it's one of the most beautiful parts of the entire Christmas story. That if you look through it, you will see many things like Bethlehem where it's as if God is purposely stacking the deck against himself. So that God could sit back and say, look what I can do. Watch me. Watch this. You know what it's called? It's called the Bethlehem effect. It's what God did that first Christmas, and it's what God does continually to you and to me today. He will choose the most unlikely places to do the most incredible things. He will choose the most ordinary people, people like you and me, to do the most extraordinary things. And he will step into the most impossible circumstances, and he will turn it into Christmas. That's what he does. Why? Because he can. And so you and I, as his children, as his followers, are to never lose faith. And I know sometimes that's hard. Sometimes we want to quit. We want to throw in the towel. We want to give up. We're to never give up hope. Because that's what the Christmas story is all about. It's all about hope. It's all about faith. It's all about believing what we believe. You and I are privileged to serve and to worship a God who can. And you see it throughout the entire story, not just with Bethlehem, but in Luke chapter 2, when the announcement of the birth of the Christ is to be given, it's not announced to kings and rulers. Instead, here's what we read. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. I don't know that any of us can really grasp how insignificant and how unimportant shepherds were in that day. There truly is no cultural equivalent that we can point to today. They were considered to be a less than people. They worked with animals, they ate with animals, they slept with animals, they smelled like animals, and people treated them like animals. People looked down on shepherds. So can you imagine the scene? I mean, think about this for a moment. The scene is beginning to unfold in heaven. God is about ready to make this big announcement that the Son is going to be born. The Messiah is finally going to step out of eternity and into time. And can you imagine how this happened, how the angels come to God and they say, hey, God, listen, who's going to make the announcement? Is it going to be me? me? Which one? Which one of us, God? Which one is going to make the announcement? Is it going to be? I want to make that announcement. God, please choose me. Pick me. Pick me. Who are we going to tell, God? Who are we going to tell? Who's it going to be? Give us a list of kings. Give us a list of rulers. Who do we need to appear before? And God says, I'll tell you, who do you see those shepherds? Out in that field, they'll do just fine. 
that's who I want you to go tell if the Messiah is coming. And so I guess that's the second question we have to ask today is why shepherds? And the answer is because God can. I think that's really good news for you and me, particularly for me. I don't know about you. He can take people who are forgotten and overlooked by our culture. He can give them value. He can give them purpose, give them meaning. Why? Because that's what he does. I wonder sometimes if the shepherds, when they were out in the field in Bethlehem, if they wouldn't tell the story amongst themselves, kind of reminiscing about the past, about how their occupation was chosen for something very special. I think they probably sat there from time to time and talked about 1 Samuel chapter 16. Samuel comes to the house of Jesse to anoint what would be the second king of Israel. He's been told by God that this guy named Jesse has a slew of sons. You're going to go to his house, and you're going to choose one of those kids to be the next king of Israel. And so he comes into Jesse's house, and Jesse lines up his sons one by one, the tallest to the shortest, you know, the, the most educated, the, the best-looking, the, 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 the person who's, who is the most well-spoken, the best communicator of the group. He's got all of his kids, and Samuel goes down the line, and he's just not feeling it. He's just not, it's just not happening. He hasn't heard God's word say, lay your hands on this one. This is the one you're to set apart. This is the son that's going to be the second king of Israel. So he looks at Jesse, and he says, Got any more? He says, well, yeah, I got this one. Other, but he's, he's a little guy. He's just out, in the, he's out with the sheep. He doesn't even call him a shepherd. He just says he's out with the sheep. Samuel says, go get him. He goes and gets his youngest, and he brings him in. And God says to Samuel, this is the guy. This is the one. And Samuel lays his hands on David. He anoints him with oil, and David becomes the second king of Israel, of whose throne there would be no end. And I wonder if those shepherds outside of Bethlehem on that first Christmas, I'm sure they spoke of that story often, about the shepherd who was chosen to become the king of Israel. And then the angel appears and makes this announcement. Why the shepherds? Because he can. He's powerful. In verses 15 and 16, the story continues. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger, just as God had said, just as the angel had said. And that's not... It. I mean, why Bethlehem? Why the shepherds? I think there's one more question we have to ask ourselves. Why Mary? Of all the women in the world, why her? Answer? Because he can. Pretty simple outline. I wonder if the shepherds were surprised by this entire setting. I mean, think about it. A baby lying in a feeding trough, this young teenage mother in a stable. Why would God choose Mary in the first place? If you think about it, she really didn't have a whole lot to bring to the table, did she? She was from this little town of Nazareth, a place of less than people. Nothing impressive on her resume. There was nothing of importance, nothing that she really had ever accomplished in her life's work. The Bible really doesn't tell us much about Mary. I think in our time and within church history, we made more of her than really Scripture tells but we don't know much about her. We don't know when and where she died. The Bible rarely gives her a speaking part. The only time we really read about her is in the Christmas story. How did God choose her and why? I mean, she and Joseph were so poor, they didn't even have enough money to offer the sacrificial lamb when the baby was to be dedicated at the temple. They didn't have enough money to buy the sacrificial lamb, so they bought two doves and used that as a sacrifice. They couldn't afford the sacrificial lamb for the sacrificial lamb. I don't know if you see the irony in that. I mean, she's not married to a ruler, not a prince. She's married to a pauper, a carpenter. She's not especially educated, no master's degree, no doctorate. Should she really be the one entrusted to training and teaching the Son of God? 
I mean, God, why? Why would you choose her? Because he can. That's why. Why would he choose you? And why would he choose me, of all people, to be a communicator for him in the 21st century? Why? Because he can. And because that's how God demonstrates his power. It's through common, ordinary people, just like you and me, who don't have a whole lot to bring to the table, don't have impressive resumes, so to speak, but he can choose you and he can choose me to turn the world upside down for him. He did it with 12 ordinary men. And when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Through us, he, dis- he delivers his power. Through us, he displays his grace. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that God chooses the weak things of the world. He chooses the things that are foolish in the eyes of the world so that no one can boast before him. That's who God chooses. He chooses it to demonstrate his power, to de- display his grace. It's always how he's worked in history. It's the Bethlehem effect. God chooses the most ordinary people to accomplish the most extraordinary things. So for Abraham, he waits until Abraham is old. For Jacob, Jacob was insecure. Leah was the most unattractive of the two sisters. Moses stuttered. Gideon was poor. Samson was proud. Rahab was immoral. David had an affair. Jeremiah was depressed. Jonah was disobedient. Naomi was a widow. John the Baptist was eccentric to say the least. Peter was impulsive and and hot-tempered. Martha worried a lot. The Samaritan woman had several failed marriages. Zacchaeus was unpopular. Thomas had doubts. Paul was in poor health. And the list goes on and on and on. How have God choose ordinary, insignificant people to do incredible things through? It's the Bethlehem effect. When you read through the Christmas story and you wonder, God, why? What? In your world, are you thinking, (laughs) why would you do it this way? These things do not indict God as being this absent-minded being who somehow forgot to provide an extra room at the inn. Instead, they reveal to you and they reveal to me just how powerful God is. That God can work in any situation to accomplish his purpose in the lives of insignificant people. You see, if Jesus would have been born in a big city, think about this for a moment. If Jesus would have been born in a big city, then maybe people would have said, well, right time, right place, look what faith can do. If he would have been born into wealth, people might have said, well, look what money can do. If he were born into a prominent family, people would say, "Uh, look what fame can do. If Jesus were born to the son of a king, to be the son of a king, people might have said, look what power can do. But he wasn't. He was born in a nothing town called Bethlehem to a teenage girl from Nazareth named Mary, whose fiancé was a carpenter, and he was laying to rest in a feeding trough. As we wrap this up, as you read through the Christmas story, In my opinion, there is only one conclusion that you and I can reach. Look what God can do. Think about that. Look what he can do from virtually nothing. I mean, he created the world from nothing. Look what he can do. And if he can do it for Bethlehem, don't you think he can do it for another obscure, tiny little village called Juliota? And if he can do it for the shepherds, a nothing people, he can do it for you, and he can do it for me. And if he can do it for Mary, if he can choose Mary, then maybe, just maybe, he could choose us. And in my opinion, That's the greatest story ever told. Look what God can do. He can remove all the worldly props. He can remove all the possible crutches. And he doesn't need any help to do it. Why? 
because he can. So we sometimes will look at our life, and if we're honest, we'd have to say, God, what are you thinking? I mean, really. Things haven't turned out for me the way I thought they would. God, my future is really uncertain right now. I don't know where I'm going to be. Financially, I'm not sure how we're going to make it. Maybe it's a job that you're searching for. You say, God, I've been looking for a long time. God, what are you thinking? My marriage is in trouble. Maybe as a parent this year, you feel overwhelmed. They haven't been too nice. They've been more naughty than they've been nice. You are just exhausted. You're tired. He's thinking, God, what were you thinking? This isn't the way I scripted it. You thought it would be different this Christmas, right? And you're very aware that when you get together around your table this holiday season and there's different family members that come in from different parts of the country, you're very much aware that your household could become a reality show, right? It could be. I mean, it's past dysfunction. And maybe some of you in this room, for one reason or another, are feeling very much less than. Less than ordinary. You feel as if you've got nothing to bring to the table, nothing to offer. And you know, like I know at times, your own failures and your own mistakes could ruin you. God, this isn't the way I thought it would be. I thought it would be different. I thought my story would be different. How about you? I can't think of a better gift to give to God than the gift of your life. I think that's what he wants more than anything else in this this world. He wants your heart. He wants your soul. He wants your mind. And he wants your strength. He wants the essence of your being. I'm going to ask our prayer partners if they would come forward. We're going to end our service right now. If you have a decision to make, if you would like to talk to one of our, our prayer partners, they're going to be up front. I'm going to ask you to stand as I pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the greatest story ever told. I thank you for your son Jesus who came into this world at just the right time to redeem us to you. God, that's the message of hope and of joy that we share as brothers and sisters in Christ. But Father, there's people in this room right now who don't have that joy, they don't have that hope because they don't know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. I pray, God, as our service ends just now, that they'll come, they'll talk to one of our prayer partners. And Father, they'll leave here with the greatest gift that you have ever given us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas.